Greetings YouTube and welcome to gardening with DJ Bonebreaker. Decided to do something a little bit different for my tech and travel channel today because, well, you know, with COVID-19 and everything, I haven't got to do much traveling this year, so I thought I'd show you guys around my yard with some of the uh, more unusual and exotic plants that I grow. So let's get started here. Starting out near the uh, edge of the road, this is uh, one of the two Yucca Gloriosa uh, Lone Star plants that I have. I need to see about uh, making a proper bed for this thing, but you can see here where the uh, it actually was a three got three foot high on a trunk before it like fell over, and it looks like the uh, growing end of the trunk starting to root down over there. And we've got several pups uh, taken over. And this plant here is a uh, native prairie grass called uh, Tripsacum dactyloides, or eastern gamma grass. It's a close relative of corn. And like corn, as you can see here, it has uh, auxiliary, um, we call them flower heads. And as you can see here with this particular one, is they're kind of like a single tassel from corn with like a single row of kernels on the ear, as it were. And you can see it's got silk like corn does too. But aside from that, it looks a bit like Johnson grass. And uh, this one here is still getting established. I got it from uh, alongside the road some patch of weeds in South Carolina when I was visiting my uncle last year and I'm hoping it'll fill in really nice I mean it's already gotten a lot bigger than it was last year thanks to you know having some special TLC and stuff instead of just being mowed over by the highway department this plant here which unfortunately not uh, the uh, is None of these flowers are open yet. On it is uh, Silphium terebinthinaceum, or prairie rosinweed. And it's a native uh, prairie plant that grows out in the Midwest. I got this from Plant Delights Nursery several years ago, mainly because I wanted something that was native and had like these big, almost tropical looking leaves on it. And, uh, Right here is a uh, Yucca Gloriosa variegata, which I got at Lowe's, I think about eight years ago. No, seven years, yeah, seven years ago, or maybe six years ago, shortly after I moved into the house. And it's been slowly and steadily growing here. So there's a couple years when it would, wouldn't do doing too good, but it seems to be doing all right now. Of course, my shadow's getting in the way. And this is one of my uh, keeper plants that I've uh, discovered. I got this thing, I think it was five years ago, maybe six, at uh, the Giving Tree uh, Farmer's Market outside of Shinkatig, Virginia. And this is a uh, Yucca Gloriosa subspecies recurvifolia variety cousin it, which uh, this thing here currently about four and a half feet tall, so it's about as big as the its uh, namesake, and it does look kind of like cousin it from the Adams family. <clears throat> and uh, this is the other uh, Lone Star yucca that I also got. I got the uh, the two Lone Star yuccas and the um, cousin it yuccas at nurseries and at that uh, nursery in uh, Shinkatig, the growing tree one. <clears throat> now this here is a uh, Musa Bastu that I just got this year at local Amish owned uh, greenhouse called Lurgans. And this is one I got last year from, I think I got it from uh, the same place but it wasn't doing too good. And I think I've realized what the key determining factor for growing these bananas is. 
and I've started adding like you know additional organic um, compost to the soil and uh, this is a native prairie grass that actually grow is native to this area because I've seen them growing wild it's a uh, switchgrass or uh, panicum virgatum and it's a major component of the tall grass prairie and is also native to you know the northeast as well growing along like you know streams and other breaks in the woodlands you know or get enough light to grow and uh, I've had this one for about five years now kind of head back uh, up to the east this row kind of got things. This is a Crinum um, X Paoli, which is a hybrid hardy version of the uh, Crinum. It's one of the hardiest uh, Crinum lilies out there. And uh, I got it from a place, again, outside of Chincoteague, but this one's uh, Thomas uh, Gardens, which is a nursery specialized in rare plants. And I, I bought some from there before, but they didn't make it. And then the guy who owns the place told me that um, crinum lilies, even in like you know more tropical areas, like to be planted deep. So I planted the uh, like dug down two feet, dropped the pot in the hole, and basically covered up till just the leaves are poking out. And it seems to work because I mean this thing keep, has been coming back for like at least three years now. And this is another plant that I got at the uh, Thomas Rare, or Thomas Gardens. It's a Montauk Daisy, which is a type of uh, daisy. And it's in the sunflower family. But it's a type of daisy that uh, is actually a shrub. I mean, le the leaves will die off every winter, but it comes back, and I think it looks rather pretty. And it usually blooms near the end of September, beginning of October. So it's one of the last things in the garden that bloom. And right next to it, I've got my big old sage plant. Well, sage bush, I guess you could call it. That I started when I first moved in here seven years ago. And not much to say other than, you know, I get sage from it, you know, every so often for cooking. And it's been hanging in there. Some years it does better than others for whatever reason, but, you know, it is what it is. And now here, and here are two of my most recent acquisitions. And as you can tell by the uh, big uh, planter pots that they're in, these are dwarf Cavendish bananas. And I'm planning on bringing them in towards the end of the month and keeping them inside over winter and trying to grow bananas inside because these are actually uh, a fruiting banana. So we'll see how that goes. And over here is my uh, vegetable garden, well vegetable and herb garden. Got some mountain mint which is this, uh, this uh, plant here. And then right next to it, I got some uh, white eggplants, and I need to harvest <laughs> some. These things produce like uh, zucchini almost. And uh, behind those, I have some Swiss chard, which I, again, I need to harvest some more leaves. And it looks like groundhog's been after that particular one. I've been having issues with this one particular groundhog who's been eating my plants like crazy. And this is a castle spire holly. It's the female version. I have the male version as well out back for pollination uh, purposes. And I get berries on it, which, you know, birds like to eat. So that's why I plant it there. And uh, over here, we've got a uh, common rue bush down here. And then towering above it is my, uh, I think it's a yeah, five-year-old maybe six year old uh, Musa Bastu, which is a hardy fiber banana. And as you can see, it's growing up above the uh, edge of the roof of the house. <laughs> and it, it dies back every winter and starts coming up, you know, around May. And I mean, just look at the size of the trunk on this. I mean, one of the biggest trunks. I mean, the thing is like, let me see if I can get a better picture of it here. 
Yeah, just there. There we go. Look at how big that thing is. It's like four inches across. <laughs> And right next to it is uh, one of the plants that's actually here when I first bought the house is a uh, red hot poker. Is I believe it's a uh, Knipophia um, uvularia, and it does really well. And as you can see, it it bloomed this year, but it blooms early, so you know it is what it is. And over here, I got a cardamom plant that I'm going to be growing inside this winter. Because, you know, I got this late in the year. Again, I got it from Thomas uh, Gardens. Same with the Dwarf Cavendish Bananas. And starting next year, my idea is I'm going to plant it outside in the front yard. Let it grow. And then when it dies back during, you know, after the first frost, I'm going to dig it up. And then, you know, separate off some turmeric roots. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, use that for cooking. But yeah, it's a tur turmeric or cucurma longa. And right behind it, this uh, bush here is a uh, Mojave um, pyracantha that I planted several years ago. And growing among this, which I need to move, this is a uh, Sartomatum uh, venosum, I believe it is. It's a uh, known as a voodoo lily. It's a member of the Aram family that gets these uh, funky looking flowers early in the spring before the leaves come up and then the, uh, the, the smell kind of rancid and then you know the leaves come up. And when I originally planted here this pyracantha wasn't near nowhere near as big as it is now but unfortunately the pyracantha is kind of taken over so I need to move these to a place where they don't get uh, shaded out so easily and over yeah there's wow there's several uh, plants coming up from that thing but over here i've got some uh, colocasia pink china that i got from brian's botanicals uh, last spring when i went out there to uh, louisville kentucky and they're the hardiest variety of uh, col or colocasia or elephant ear plant and right next to them is something that started up by itself uh, about six years ago, but this is uh, bronze fennel, it's a funicula, um, I forget what the proper scientific name is, but it's the same fennel they use for spices, and I use the, uh, the leaves and occasionally seeds for, you know, flavoring stuff, and I happen to, you know, they see all these, uh, trimmed off things here but basically it's been self-seeding and trying to take over this flower bed and I need to get rid of it from extirpate it from the flower bed so I can actually grow you know flowers in it speaking of which this here is a uh, eucumus that I got again Thomas uh, Thomas Gardens last year it's uh, one of the hardy varieties of eucumus and next to it is uh, some more um, crinum of the hardy varieties. This one here is one that I got at Plant Delights uh, Nursery last year and this, or no wait, this is another one that I got Thomas uh, Garden, Crinum X Powelli, and planted there and it's been doing pretty good. And this is a one that I got at Plant Delights, is a Crinum Glory, another hybrid hardy crinum. And uh, this is a stargazer lily that I planted a couple years ago. Done blooming now. They bloom pretty much throughout July and in the beginning of August, but then they're done. But I do like the way their foliage looks, even after flowers are done. And this is another hardy crinum I got uh, from Plant Delights Nursery last year. It's a uh, crinum antares. Gets a red flower on it once it gets you know flower size and this here is something I got 12 years ago at uh, Brian's Botanicals it's something that Brian's father got from a friend in Italy it's some kind of hybrid variety of yucca 
he thinks is a cross between yucca um, aloefolia or yucca gloriosa and uh, yucca filamentosa but it gets short trunks on it up to like about a foot and a half and it's got very stiff spiny leaves so it's a nice semi-tropical looking yucca but just fully hardy in this area I actually had it planted behind my parents house before I moved out uh, in 2012 and then moved it out to here so I've had that one for a while now and over here is a uh, another hardy crinum I'm trying to remember which oh no no this is not a crinum this is uh, another hardy eucumus that I got at uh, Brian's Botanicals eucumus uh, glow sticks and right next to that which part of the reason why I'm trimming back this stuff is this plant right here is uh, it's Alstromeria uh, Sweet Laura, which is the hardiest uh, variety of, of uh, Zephyr Lily. And I've had this thing for about six years now, growing here. It was doing a lot better last year and earlier this year, but then this uh, fennel was like arching over it and shooting it out. So, like I said, I'm going to be removing all this fennel here soon-ish and then trying to get up all the weeds out of this bed. This is the first of the fl new flower beds I've put in starting uh, 2017, I think it was. I didn't get it finished because that was the year my mom's uh, cancer became terminal and she got put on hospice care, so yeah. But anyways, I, I did actually manage, no, it was actually 2016 when I started on this one. I did have this like all mulched and and had uh, compost added and topsoil added, but then the water main broke up the road and washed everything out of the garden. Then I got that done 2017 or maybe, no, it was last 2018, not 2017. Got everything all done up nicely, got the uh, mulched and uh, and uh, composted and everything and then the water main broke like right outside right outside my the end of my driveway and washed everything out of the flower bed I'm half afraid that if I mulch and compost this uh, again this year that the water main is gonna break again <laughs> but we'll see anyways moving right along this here is a uh, one that I got in 2013 it's a yucca Gloriosa variety recurva fully. I got it Thomas uh, um, Yeah, Thomas garden rare plants is one of the first uh, Things I bought at that particular plant place uh, when I was down in Chicotique with my ex-wife and her family And it's done fairly well since then the only issue I had with it is I accidentally when I was trying to drag something through the yard it, it fell flopped over and broke like one of the trunks but, I mean, it's recovered since then, and it's been doing quite well. And immediately behind it, this massive clump of uh, bamboo is a uh, Fargesia Ruffa uh, Sunset Glow that I purchased in 2013 when I first moved in here. There's like nothing in this part of the uh, flower bed except weeds, so I just planted this bamboo which is a clump forming variety. If this is a running variety, it would have taken over the entire flower bed by now. <laughs> as long ago as I planted it. But it's very pretty, very uh, robust, and very hardy bamboo. In fact, I'm actually thinking about separating off some plugs of it next spring and planting in some other areas where I need, you know, something to fill in so I don't have to mow them anymore. <laughs> and uh, right here is something I got I think it was two years ago, no, I got it in 2017 or 2018, I'm trying to remember. This is a Crinum Super Ellen, and this is the largest and one of the hardiest of the uh, hardy crinums, but look how wide the leaves are. This thing gets almost as big as the tropical uh, poison bulb crinums, 
as you see playing all over the place in Florida and Hawaii. And it gets like this really tall flower spike. I mean, the thing was about four and a half, five feet tall with these big pink, like, and I mean not like faint pink either, but like a bright pink uh, flowers on it. I got a couple pictures that I took earlier. But yeah, it's, it's right next to it is a honeyberry bush, which doesn't seem to be doing the best. So who knows if that'll if that's going to make it or not. But right next to it, I've got some uh, Chinese ground orchids of different varieties I've decided to try out. And this is a Zingiber Myoga uh, Dancing Crane, which is a variegated variety of hardy Japanese ginger. And I've been growing this stuff here since 2013 or 2014. And it survived like one of the, I think it was like the second coldest winter we've had on record. Well, at least not this particular plant, but the one that, that I'll be showing you when I get around the backside of the house. And again, here's another Mojave uh, pyracantha that I planted a couple years back to replace some fugly yew bushes that were originally growing, planted out front of the house. And right here, I've got some uh, uh, Carrick skep Skepsosa, which is a type of semi, well, at least here, semi-evergreen um, flowering sedge. You see it's got like these uh, spikes of pink flowers that come out, which is something unusual. And this is one I got at Plant Delights that last year that almost didn't make it because of how dry it was. Shortly after I started, uh, I brought it back home and planted it. I kind of got behind on watering it, but it managed to come back, so hopefully it'll get bigger next year. And right here is uh, one of the more interesting plants I have in my collection. This is uh, Rapidophyllum hystrix, uh, needle palm. This is the hardiest true palm in the world, well one of the hardiest at least. And I bought this at a uh, Walmart, I believe it was in North Carolina in 2016. I'm way back from visiting my uncle and uh, or no actually I wasn't visiting my uncle. I was visiting my one friend from the Navy who lives in uh, South Carolina and it's been growing outside here ever since and you can see it seems to handle the uh, the cold wet winters we have here quite nicely and right behind it is uh, one of several I have right here a couple more, but these are variegated variety of uh, Rhodia japonica, which is a hardy relative of uh, snake plants. So you can see it has this thick, leathery, snake planty looking leaves. And these things actually stay green all winter. And right next to them, they're getting kind of uh, frazzled looking because it's late in the year, but these are native uh, fairy bell flowers which I got a plant delights uh, nursery as well that like you know semi shade areas so I was like sure they get these pretty uh, yellow flowers on them so I plant them there and yeah this uh, walkways are part of the uh, project of uh, installing these flower beds that I did as well and over here I got some more um, dancing crane, hardy ginger, got a uh, Jerusalem artichoke, which unfortunately, th this thing used to be completely covered in Jerusalem artichokes, but uh, unfortunately it's gotten too shady, so I've had to uh, rethink the uh, plants that I have back here. So what I did is I planted ostrich plume fern and some hostas, which I'm kind of hoping will fill in. And I also planted another hardy ginger back here, which I'm also hoping will maybe kind of take over because this thing tends to get kind of weedy and over here is another one of the uh, castle wall or castle spire holly bushes and uh, this is a chinese ground orchid which i first planted i think seven years ago in 2013 it's been absolutely flourishing over here and uh, right next to it is some uh Shibataya kumasasa, which is a dwarf um, running bamboo. And the reason why I'm willing to risk the running bamboo, and I've actually had to kind of like 
cut it back and you know move it away from this uh, stuff a bit is because it's like super small and super thin and it's easy to keep in check with the lawnmower so yeah <laughs> and some more uh, dancing crane uh, hardy ginger right here where that planted several years back is actually this clump here was a source for the clumps that I have growing in the other flower, two flower beds over there. I've just been dividing it off. And this right here, speaking of like running bamboos, this is a bamboo that I originally obtained from alongside the road in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee in spring of 2005, shortly after I got out of the Navy. We're down visiting my one aunt who since passed, away, passed on and I spotted it along the road so me and my uncle went and uh, decided to see about digging up a bit of it. It was in the section of the road where they mow every year to you know keep the grass back so I figured you know we're basically rescuing it. But this is Arundinaria gigantea which is the only bamboo that's native to the United States and the only bamboo that's native to uh, North America aside from Mexico or outside of Mexico but yeah I again I brought this from where the, I had a plant in the woods behind my parents house where it's barely surviving and moved it to here and it's uh, spread out quite a bit uh, since uh, 2013 and it's doing quite well and uh, even though Arundinary Gigantia is not supposed to be endemic to Pennsylvania the fact that um, it's endemic to New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, and Ohio, and in similar climate zones as what you can find in Pennsylvania, a lot of botanists theorize that uh, it originally was endemic to Pennsylvania, but it was extirpated fairly early on in the colonial era by uh, European colonists, clearing it out because uh, wherever the river cane grew, it tended to enrich the soil so they know that it was good for growing crops so they just white burn all the sugar cane or yeah, sugar, river cane out and uh, plant crops in its place and this kind of getting slowly engulfed by the uh, bamboo grove is uh, one of my three um, citrus or ponserous trifoliata which are hardy citrus trees and you can see here got some green uh, little orange looking citrus fruits on it and I mean even when they're fully ripe the fruits are really sour and and or bitter but they're kind of good for juicing so I mean I, plus you know how many people could say they're growing orange growing citrus in uh, <laughs> in central Pennsylvania of course like I said in addition to citrus I'm also growing bananas in central Pennsylvania this is another one of my old, two oldest uh, this is the other of my two oldest Musa Bastu plants this one isn't as big as the other one out front because the soil here is mostly like you know hard rocky clay but I've been starting this year to uh, add additional organic matter to the soil at the base of the plants and hopefully they'll get bigger next year but yeah yeah these uh, flowering uh, cherry trees were here when I first bought the house and part of the reason to be perfect honest why I ended up buying a house and uh, this is uh, Endocalamus tessellatus another semi dwarf uh, running bamboo it's also a bamboo with one of the largest um, leaves of any bamboo in the world. Like to give you an idea, this is how wide this leaf is. And the leaf's at least uh, 18 inches long. So it's about four inches across and 18 inches long. And it gives like a nice tropical, almost like a shrubby palm tree look to this uh, weedy area here. Which is part of the reason why I plant it here is to kind of fighting fire with fire because it seemed like nothing I can do keeps these uh, weeds in check. So I just decided to plant a more attractive and easier to control weed 
in to, to push them back. It's kind of actually what I did with the uh, with this uh, Shibataya Kumasasa grove here. Originally, this was nothing but like daylilies and weeds and blackberry brambles, and I just uh, planted the Shibataya Kumasasa, and well, <laughs> now I've got a nice little evergreen uh, bamboo gro grove that looks nice and tropical. And here's my other honeyberry bush, which again, looking kind of sad, getting late in the year like this. Didn't get any berries off of it this year either. Hopefully next year I'll get some berries. Here's another one of the uh, Saromatum plants and uh, another uh, pink uh, fairy sedge that I got last year from Plant Delights Nursery. And this is a Zingiber Myoga um, white feather, which is kind of like an inverse of the variegation pattern the Dancing Crane has that I also got at Plant Delights last year. I'm hoping this will spread out and fill in this area because, again, this tends to get a lot of weeds. This uh, shrub here is one of uh, what I like to refer to as my gnarly natives. It's one of the more unusual native plants. This is a Lindera benzoine or uh, common spice bush and the reason why it's called that is if you crush the leaves it smells kind of like um, kind of like old spice deodorant or something similar and these berries are uh, prized by birds and wildlife and I think they're also edible for humans I haven't really tried them myself <laughs> but uh, yeah part of the reason I bought it is I had a uh, uh, viburnum back here and one year the viburnum I guess it got too wet for it because we had like an unusually wet year I think it was two years ago and it just uh, got some kind of root rot and up and croaked and I was like you know what how about I get something that's like native can tolerate a fair amount of shade and doesn't mind you know extra moisture so I got a spice bush and you can find these grown in the mountains along the streams and stuff like that. And like I said, I think it's a rather attractive looking bush and it's uh, useful for wildlife. Like in addition to providing food for birds, there's a type of butterfly whose uh, caterpillars feed on the leaves. It's called the, uh, actually called the spice bush uh, butterfly. And it's one of my hostas that I had originally at my parents' house and moved here when I moved in doing quite well and here's the other spice bush that I got and planted I think this I don't know if the, the spice bushes are dioecious or monoecious but I'm thinking this might be a male plant and that might be a female plant if they are monoecious which means I kind of lucked out with that and uh, over here before I continue into the backyard this is a uh, Mahonia that I dug up from my uncle's place. It, like there's this like weedy woods behind his house in Wahala, South Carolina. And for several years it basically didn't really do a whole lot. But now it's starting to take off, so I'm really happy to see that. And I got a blooming uh, la variegated liriope right next to it and a black raspberry uh, vine. And down here is a uh, this is a evergreen lily of the valley, basically. It's a, I'm trying to remember the scientific name again. It's, um, oh, come on. Actually, wait, let me see if I can find it. It's, uh, oh yeah, Spirantha convalaroides. I think that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, Spirantha convalaroides. But it's basically an evergreen lily of the valley. And again, it's pretty hardy. It makes it through the winter every year. Another hosta. This is a blue angel hosta. And down along here, I've got yet another one of my clumps of uh, Rhodia japonica that I've had for over 10 years. Really likes this nice shady spot that it's growing in. And uh, over here, 
Well, this is where I originally planted it, but it didn't like it, so kind of the original plant died and then suckered off and produced some two new clumps of uh, pawpaw trees. Well, more like shrubs is the way these things are grown here. But uh, pawpaws are uh, Asamina triloba, and they're the uh, hardiest member of the custard apple family. And the only one that just about the only ones found outside the tropics. And again, these things have enormous leaves which give a nice lush tropical look during the uh, year. And they get these uh, fruits that are about, I say they get about six inches uh, long and about maybe three inches wide. Have really big seeds in them, but you know, you can easily spit those out. But the fruits kind of remind me of like a cross between a pear and a banana. And uh, yeah, I got some more uh, Zingerber Myoga white feather here. A blueberry bush, which actually has a blueberry on it this year. <laughs> and uh, this is a variegated Solomon seal that I got from local nursery. Doing quite nicely. And this is uh, another older planting to get this uh, stick out of the way of uh, Spirantha convaleroides. This been doing rather nicely. Another hot that I've had for here for quite a while. And this is a uh, dancing crane hardy ginger, which I can't actually remember planting this here, but it's been here for at least five years or six years now. And I don't remember I, if actually planting is here so I think I might have planted it and just forgot about it but I had planted like this banana tree here that's supposed to be hardy but turned out to not be quite so hardy <laughs> and this is a hydrangea bush that my ex-wife got but I decided to keep because I like how you know the flowers well of course it's pretty much done blooming for the year and uh, before I move on to the rest of that flower bed this is a, another pawpaw tree that I got last year and I got the cage around it because uh, one of the issues I was having is the groundhogs in my yard were biting the uh, biting the trees off and you know basically killing them. So I actually lost two pawpaws that way. So I started putting cage, mesh cages around them to keep the stupid groundhogs away. And here's another uh, Rhodia japonica, another hosta. And this looks like a Rhodia japonica that actually came up from seeds because my uh, Rhodias actually flower fairly regularly and get and set seeds. So I didn't know they could actually become naturalized like this, unless this is like you know from a stolen or something. And here's the uh, male version of the uh, castle spire, castle wall holly. Unfortunately, this one hasn't done so good. I think I need to see about maybe amending the soil or something. And you got another uh, spirantha patch behind it and some more hosses. And this is actually kind of one of the things that really got me started in all this. As you can see, this is at least four feet tall, maybe taller, maybe even five feet towards the back. But this is a Zingiber Myoga uh, Silver Arrow, which is a lightly variegated. You can just barely see the uh, yellow variegation on the leaves. Yeah, it's not disease or anything. That Those thin kind of yellowish markings are supposed to be there. But, I mean, this thing survived the second coldest winter that we've had on record in this area. And still came up in mid-April. And that's usually when it comes up every year. And as you can see, it, I started out with like a six inch pot of this and it just took off like crazy and I love it. And down here, cause I actually spotted this earlier when I was working in the yard, but yeah. You see these things right here? These are the flower buds that are starting to come out and it'll start blooming here this month. But these flower buds are actually what are used in Japanese cooking as the uh, spice uh, myoga. And this thing usually gets a ton of them, so I'll probably be harvesting a few for use 
in cooking stuff. And I found if you combine it with like chicken bouillon, it tastes exactly like the chicken broth they use for like wonton soup at Chinese restaurants. And this is a base uh, species variety of the uh, Zingerberg Myoga that I've had since 2016 or 2015, I'm sorry. But for some reason, it, it hasn't done as well as this variegated variety that's supposed to be, you know, hardier and more robust. <laughs> and over here is, uh, next to the noisy AC unit, is the, uh, um, this is a Helboris that I got about 12 years ago, maybe longer. But it's like a, an evergreen garden plant. It gets... Uh, purple flowers on it starting around Lint, which is, it gives its common name, Linton Rose. And it's one of the first things in the garden to bloom, which is one of the reasons why I love it. So anyways, moving back past the, uh, the deck here and the old uh, shed, got my big uh, peppermint patch and right here and I'm thinking about moving this next year because it's getting more shade than it likes is uh, Xantodicia Ethiopica and this thing actually was here since before I moved into the house so obviously these uh, this variety of Xantodicia is unusually hardy because most Xantodicia or um, calla lilies won't make it around here through the winter time that is so I'm thinking about moving this thing out front next year you know early in the spring when it's starting to come up so get more sunlight and not get crowded out by the uh, by the rhodia and the uh, peppermint <laughs> now this is another thing that was here when I first moved in is uh, zebra grass or uh, maiden grass it's, um, Miscanthus uh, sinensis, I think. But I actually read recently that I think this grass has been declared as a invasive weed in Pennsylvania, so I might be um, trying to extricate this next year and then planting something that's not as invasive or weedy. And right next to it is uh, yet another one of my uh, pawpaw trees that I started again. It was growing slowly and steadily, and then this spring, this older part of it just died. And then it just sent up all these suckers in this uh, side branch that had already started growing just really took off. So I'm hoping this will form like a nice cluster of uh, pawpaw trees on this uh, bank here so I don't have to mow this stupid bank anymore. And over here is a... Uh, Aromatinaya uh, Russian quince. It's one of few types of quinces that are sweet enough to eat without cooking. Unfortunately, the second one that I got was killed by groundhogs uh, shortly after I got it. And that's hence the, uh, the mesh uh, barrier around the base of it. So, yeah, I'm hoping to get another one, but unfortunately, the, the place that I ordered them from has uh, been on back order for a while. And I'm gonna actually head down this way before I head up the slope. This is a North Wind Panicum Virgatum, which again, native, uh, cultivated variety of a native prairie grass. And birds love the seeds and it provides habitat for like animals and stuff. Plus, more importantly, it covers up a lot of the uh, banks so I don't have to mow it. <laughs> Because yeah, seriously, I've, I've lost track of how many times I've lost my footing and almost gone under the mower trying to mow this, uh, this bank here. And right next to it is uh, Yushania Confusa, which is a virtually unknown in cultivation uh, clump-forming bamboo from China. And it's the hardiest uh, species of uh, Yushania out there. I got it from Plant Delights Nursery on a, like, yeah, we'll see if this thing does anything. And it was originally like a two-inch pot, no, three-inch pot that I bought back in 2014 or 2015. It was like, yeah, we'll see how it does. Well, it, it did absolutely amazing. 
I mean, just look at these lovely little leaves and the graceful bamboo stems. It almost looks like something from a Chinese painting. And here is uh, the last of the pawpaw trees that I planted shortly after moving in. This one's been growing slowly but steadily. I'm guessing probably getting a little bit too much shade over here. Uh, this plant here is uh, Xanthoxylum americanum or uh, common prickly ash. I got this from a quarry that was about to be old, well, it used to be abandoned quarry, but they're starting to reactivate it. And I saw they're ripping out like a bunch of these rare native plants that were growing there. So I uh, <laughs> dug this up since it was growing like right alongside the road too in the uh, area that's mowed and planted behind my parents' house. And then I dug up two suckers from that particular one there a couple years ago and moved them here. And it's been doing quite well since then, so I'm happy. And this right over here is uh, what's sometimes called elephant grass, is uh, Miscanthus giganteus, and this stuff gets huge. I got it at a local nursery a couple years ago to kind of fill in this uh, difficult to mow area. So anyways, moving right along, time to head back uh, down the uh, slope here or I should say up the slope and uh, get the rest of these plants in here yeah oh before I get too much further on right next to the uh, uh, aromatony uh, quince is some uh, northern wood oats which is a native uh, forest grass that's often grown as ornamental I got these from uh, I think I got these from that local Amish nursery a couple years ago. They've been doing all right. And uh, this is another cousin it yucca that I got from Shingatigue. And this thing right here is a hardy spurge. It's closely related to uh, poinsettias. And the flowers even kind of look like what's inside the uh, fake flowers that poinsettias have. And I mean, this stuff just got absolutely huge. I didn't, wasn't expecting to quite get this big, but it seems to like the rather dry, uh, sunny slope that I have planted on. <laughs> and uh, here is a uh, hardy banana that I got last year. I think I got it from Thomas Gardens in Chincoteague. And this is my second largest one, even though it's only two years old. And it started with like a three gallon plant but I planted the base of an old locust tree stump and that's what gave me the idea that it was the, the amount of organics in the soil that, that seemed to affect the banana growth so that's why I've been starting to really up the uh, amount of uh, compost I'm putting around these bananas but I, it just looks so tropical I love it and this is uh, one of the few things that's actually blooming in the yard right now. This is a uh, Vitex Agnus Castus, or Monk's Pepper. It's a small, a large shrub or small tree in the mint family. And it got these funky leaves, which kind of look like some plant that you shouldn't really be growing, but I guarantee it's, it's a legit plant. And you, see, you can see, if you look really close at the new growth, you can kind of see the square mint stems that are typical of like herbaceous mints. But uh, they used to, the reason why it's called monk's peppers, they used to brew uh, tea from the leaves that's supposed to um, be basically like the opposite of an aphrodisiac. It was basically supposed to make it so that you weren't interested in that kind of stuff. Hence why, you know, monks drank it. But they do, the leaves do have a very pleasant aroma if you crush them. And all in all, you know, it's just another interesting plant. So I had to have it. <laughs> and right next to this uh, Musa Bass Jew is a uh, hardy flowering quince. It gets these really beautiful orangish red flowers in the springtime. And it's doing a very good job of also helping control the weeds on this uh, slope so 
Yeah, the, between it and another one of the hardy spurges that I've planted, it's doing quite well. And these spurges are actually evergreen, which is really nice too. It's, it gives this tropical look year round, even in the dead of winter when it's you know covered in snow. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, is it um, Tamarix uh, ramosa, I, I believe is the, the scientific name. But this is a pink cascade variety of the common tamarisk or salt cedar. Now, out west, this, thing's, this species is a very highly invasive weed, but in the east, due to the fact that the conditions that are required for the seeds to germinate very rarely ever happen, and if they do, there's a lot of native plants that are, that are better adapted to those conditions that will easily outcompete them, it's not an uh, invasive weed. In fact, I talked to a guy in Virginia who sold these uh, things, and he said that he's seen like some very large tamarix trees in uh, along the coast, but he's never seen any seedlings, mainly because the uh, very specific like floodplain type conditions just don't exist in the east. Unlike out west where they have like you know the arroyos and temperate things. Let me check this. Is a tamarisk ramosima ramos. Sisma, that's how it is, yeah, pronounced. But yeah, I'm hoping that it'll grow more vertical and less like this, otherwise I'm gonna start having to prune the crap out of it. <laughs> but other than that, I really like the very thin, like faint cedar-like uh, leaves that it has, which actually are deciduous. This thing will actually be bare during the winter time, but I mean, aside from that, uh, I really like how it looks. <laughs> And this is yet another um, Musa Bass Jew that I started last year that's been doing fairly well. And I'm hoping to start like a nice clump of uh, bananas here as well. And speaking of bananas, this is a Musa Itinerans uh, variety Shishuang Banensis, which is supposed to be as hardy as the Musa Bass Jew. And unfortunately, I can't seem to get like decent sized plants to really fully test this. But I got this from Brian's Botanicals last year, and it was about this size too. But again, I'm hoping with the addition of additional compost and stuff around it, which is kind of covered up with uh, grass clippings right now, that this thing will get bigger next year, but we'll see. And. Uh, Right here beside the garage is uh, this ginormous uh, grass is uh, Arundo Donax or the giant reed. And I actually bought this thing 24 years ago, no 25 years ago from local nursery that's just up the road. And I transplant, it, it almost got shaded out to where it was about to almost dead, you know, the year that I moved into this place. And I transplanted, and it was like very scrawny and, you know, just barely fit in like a half gallon pot. And within two years, it just got this enormous again. <laughs> and I love it. So I basically have like on one side of the garage, I have my own private banana plantation and on the other side of the garage I got this giant you know reed and these reeds are actually used for making uh, the reeds for woodwind instruments like saxophones and oboes and and clarinets and stuff like that and they're also used by this uh, group of people known as marsh Arabs for making like uh, temporary houses and stuff or at least were traditionally used by them because these things are native to like the uh, Mediterranean and uh, Middle East. And here is yet another uh, cousin it yucca that I planted a couple years ago. Growing uh, on the bank here, doing quite well for itself. And as we're getting near the end of this uh, video here, which is actually turning out to be a lot longer than I expected, <laughs> is... Uh, 
Fargesia nitida, which is another clumping bamboo from China. It's actually one of the species that's primary food source for the giant pandas. And I bought this one in uh, early 2005, again, right after I got out of the Navy. I got it at a garden center that's no longer in business. And it uh, started out as like a three gallon pot and it hasn't got a whole lot bigger since then. Because, you know, this, this air, it, area is a little bit too hot for it during the summertime. But I mean, it'll, it'll make it through both the summer and the winter. But, uh, yeah, it gets these, the reason, one of the reasons I like it is, um, let me see if I can find some good uh, stems. But the stems are kind of like a bluish black color, which is really uh, lovely looking. Plus, you know, it's uh, not going to take over your entire yard. And here is a, another Crinum Powelli that I got a couple years ago from Thomas Gardens. Doing okay, it actually bloomed this year, and it bloomed last year as well. Gonna see about, you know, mulching and composting it to, because it looks like it needs more um, nutrients. And here's the another uh, Montauk Daisy that I got, again, a couple years ago from Thomas Gardens in Virginia. And this is uh, Andropogen uh, I can't remember the specific name for it, but it's uh, known as turkey foot or uh, big blue stem. But this is a variety that's called rain dance that I got at the local Amish uh, nursery a couple years ago. It's these really pretty purple flowers. And last but definitely not least on this is the... Uh, this, again, is something I got in like 2006, maybe 2007, from a mail-order nursery in, uh, in the Freesboro, Tennessee, called Gardens Oive. But this is the first hardy citrus tree I ever bought, and I transplanted from my parents' house. And as you can see, this thing's absolutely loaded with, uh, <laughs> with uh, little hardy oranges. And unlike the other one that I have in the side yard over there, this one, the oranges aren't bitter at all. They're just really, really sour. So I'm probably going to try to collect these ones and maybe try to collect the seeds and see if I can't start a few more from it and maybe try to have like a selective breeding program to, you know, get some less uh, sour, less bitter, hardy, or hardy uh, citrus fruits. But we'll see <laughs> how that goes. Oh, actually, before I end this video, there's one thing I almost forgot. This here is a Sable Minor McCurtain, a dwarf palmetto that's endemic to uh, southeastern Oklahoma. And it's also in the con uh, contention for the hardiest uh, true palm species in the world. And I've had this thing planted outside uh, for, yes, yeah, since last year. And hopefully it'll do quite well for me, but we'll see. Anyways, thanks for uh, joining me to trip through my garden. And uh, until next time, this is uh, DJ Bonebreaker signing off.